So let's get underway. <laughs> Karen B. Davis has specialized in architecture, interiors, landscape design, and travel photography for over 20 years. Her career has spanned the globe, taking her to over 50 countries. She is also an accomplished writer. Her images and articles have been featured in over 60 publications worldwide, including the New York Times, Town and Country, Lonely Planet, Condé Nast Traveler, Travel and Leisure, and others. She is currently working on a third book, which is due out in 2023. Welcome, Karen B. Davis. Thank you so much. And um, first, I want to thank the New Haven Museum for having me. And I want to thank all of you for coming. So welcome. Uh, this is the cover shot, obviously, for my book, Connecticut Waters. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about how challenging it can be to get a cover shot, especially when it's a boat that's moving. And as a photographer, you're always concerned about the light. So fortunately for me, the gentleman who owned this boat, uh, John Edgington, um, who's a captain and his partner, Captain Pat Beck, um, went around this lighthouse several times while I was in a chase boat, uh, waiting for the sun to get in the right spot to get this shot. And I was really appreciative of John because he was very patient. And he also uh, has a full group of tourists on that boat that had to be patient as well. And this is John. This boat is called the Mystic Whaler and it is a replica of a coastal schooner. And coastal schooners were used to carry um, goods up and down the Eastern seaboard before the advent of trains and trucks. So he restored this boat with his partner and she's a beautiful schooner. And I'm, I'm talking in the past because John just sold this boat after owning her for 25 years. And he used to do charges out of London. So this was really wonderful that he was on the cover of the book because it was a last hurrah for him. Um, if you had gone out on the boat, you could have participated in sail training or you could have just hung out. He did lobster cruises out of New London, which was really fun and delicious. And here she is, the Mystic Whaler. Uh, fortunately, the boat, what, this is kind of an interesting, interesting story. The boat was bought by an unknown donor patron and then donated to uh, the Maritime Museum in San Francisco, where she continues with her sail training. Um, so that was really good. She's still in service and she's still running, but not here. This was the second idea I had for a cover shot. This is a uh, symphony. She was built in the 1930s, I believe, or sorry, I'm, I'm I confuse her length, which I think is 65 feet. Um, so, <clears throat> but she, she was built for the King of Sweden originally. And I thought this might be a good cover shot of her going around uh, past Ledge Light. That's not Ledge Light, a New London Light, Harbor Light in New London. Um, but I think the other image was better. So we didn't use this one. I sailed on this boat with this gentleman named Tor from Nova Scotia to Newfoundland, which is how I found out about this boat. And it is a classic wooden boat. And he, uh, it was his father's before him. And this is his son. He's hoping his son is going to take over the great amount of work involved in maintaining a historic wooden vessel. There's a lot of upkeep, varnish, maintenance. Uh, he's noticing that a lot of young people aren't that interested in doing this kind of work. So a lot of wooden boats are no longer around. But we did go sailing on this particular day in August and it was a beautiful sail. And there she is off of New London. 
And the story goes that um, his father, Tor's father, acquired the boat from a man who was given an ultimatum by his wife, who said, either your mistress goes or your boat. So he chose to kept, keep his mistress and he sold the boat. Uh, this is the Annie Laurie. She is a 1929 commuter yacht, and she used to go from Long Island to um, Wall Street in the summertime. And this was not atypical. Wealthy people would um, commute by boat in the summer to Wall Street in the financial district and banking district. They would get on in their pajamas. They would have their breakfast on board, they would read their newspapers, they would take a shower, they would get off, and then they would get back on and go home. This boat has a pipe organ, which they use in play, and it was built and designed specifically for this boat by Austin Organs in Hartford. I think they are the oldest pipe organ factory, definitely in Hartford, if not one of the oldest in the country, and they still manufacture. And this is the interior. And every boat has a cap. And this is OC, otherwise known as Orange Cat. There were several other cats before this one. This is Aphrodite. Uh, she is owned by Chuck and Deborah Royce, who also own the Ocean House. And he has restored this boat. Uh, she lives in uh, splits her time between Connecticut and Watch Hill. Uh, she's pretty old. She was a, she, I think she's a torpedo style boat and Shirley Temple had been aboard her. That's how old she goes back. And here is the interior of this beautiful boat. Very simple, but a very nice boat. And that's a picture of Shirley Temple on the wall, which you really can't see. And this is Valentine, another classic wooden boat. Uh, there is a chapter on wood, wind, and water, which highlights these boats in the book. I felt it was really important to put them in, as I said, because they are living pieces of history. And this is Valentine, and she hails from Essex. She's a beautiful boat as well. I just love wooden boats. It's really something special about them. Um, so there's also a chapter, so that those were private owned, but there's also a chapter on ways to get on the water for people who don't own their boats. And that was important to me because I wanted everyone to be able to enjoy this book and enjoy ways to get out on the water. So there's a whole chapter on that. And this is the Becky Thatcher on the Mystic, sorry, on the um, Connecticut River. And she's part of the Essex steam train and you can go out on the boat after taking the steam train and look around and they'll tell you all about the river and take you up to Gillette's castle. This is the Sabino, it's another way to get out on the water. She hails from Mystic, Connecticut. She is out of the museum, the Mystic Seaport. She is the last coal fired, uh, steam powered ferry boat in existence. And she's been restored by the museum as well. She had spent her time up in Maine before coming to the museum. And this boat is the Onrush. She's a replica of a Viking ship. She is out of the Connecticut River Museum. So you can also go out on her. And this is the Poets Lounge. Um, Good, I have that shot. I just wanted to check that for a second. This boat uh, goes out of Noank. Uh, that's Captain Darren Keach. He's also an excellent musician. So you could charter this boat for two hours, six hours overnight. You can go with your friends and family. He also has a second boat out of New London. You could charter both boats if you want. Uh, you could do three and four day sails. He's an accomplished captain and he is also a um, good musician, so you can ask him to play for you. Uh, this boat, um, there's a chapter uh, in the book on maritime education, and this boat is out of Pilot Point Marina, and it belongs to Sail Access Connecticut. Uh, it's 
takes people out there, a regular sailing club, they go out. Um, it's for people with uh, all different kinds of uh, challenges, uh, physical and otherwise. And they just really, really love this. They love to go out on the water. It makes them, it's, it's the highlight of their week every time they go out. And it also helps, you know, get the body strong and the mind, keep the mind sharp. So it's a wonderful way for them to socialize. There's also a chapter on boat builders, and this is Tom Townsend out of Mystic. It seems to me there's a lot of wooden boat builders still in Mystic. Uh, I didn't really find others in different parts of the state when working on this book, and I did want this book to be statewide, so believe me, I looked. <laughs> I went in every corner and crevice of the state, but um, here's Tom on a restored lobster boat that he uh, worked on for a client. And I thought it'd be interesting to show you how, once he's done with the boat, how does he get it to the shipyard to launch? And this is how he does it. Takes it on a truck, they put it on the lift, they put it in the water and off goes the happy client. Another interesting thing is um, this is another boat builder. His uh, name is David Snedeker, and he's out of Pawkatuck, Connecticut. I thought it'd be interesting to show you how they step a mast. So putting put the mast that they've been working on back into that sailboat, which looks completely dwarfed without its mast. And this is also a wooden boat. Its name is Black Watch. It's an antique vessel, and this is how they do it. And this is um, a Harrisoft designed boat that they've been slowly restoring. Nathaniel Harrisoft was a boat builder at the turn of the century, last century, and was responsible for designing many America's Cup defenders. His company is out of Bristol, Rhode Island. They are still making boats. They have an amazing museum there that if you ever get there, you should really go. It's beautiful, it's on the waterfront, it's very informative. And he really revolutionized the golden age of yachting with his designs. And he was neck and neck all the time with another designer called um, Olin Stevens. And I'll be showing you some of his work later, but Dave Snedeker's shop is restoring this boat called Vayu. Mystic Seaport has, um, this is still on boat building, um, is very, has been very important for boat building because what they did was they built a state-of-the-art boat lift. So this is how they're able to get huge vessels in and out of the water. So People from all over the country and sometimes the world come to have the boats worked on. Other museums, you know, commercial vessels, this kind of thing. I don't think they do stuff for individuals, but this is the Charles W. Morgan. She's the last wooden whale ship in existence. She's the reason the museum is there. And I say that because she was a dilapidated vessel. She was built in 1841 in New Bedford, Mass, left to rot after her career in 1925, uh, was donated to the mu museum by um, a man named Colonel Green. And once they had this boat, people came to see it and a whole museum got established around this boat. So anyway, this is a mechanical forklift, if you will, and it goes into the water it goes down into the water and the boat gets pulled onto it. So here they are fixing the Morgan, um, their davit bending where they bend, they steam bend that plank and they fit it while it's uh, supple to the shape of the boat. And this is her sailing. I, I can't remember exactly. I think it's been about five years. They took her on a goodwill tour. First time she sailed since her career ended. It was magnificent. It's also a chapter on working watercraft. This is uh, the Chester Hadline Ferry. 
and she is out of Hadley, Manchester. She goes across the Connecticut River. It is a five minute ride and the people that use it, it saves them a lot of time because they can get to Route 9 a lot faster. And uh, they just love it. They love that five minute ride where they're peaceful before work. They're looking out the waters. They're seeing Gillette's castle. Uh, this is the other ferry, passenger ferry we have in Connecticut further up the river. Uh, this is in Rocky Hill and it's Rocky Hill Ferry. But it needs what's called a pilot boat to operate, which is that little Cumberland boat. So it pushes it and makes sure that it's going in the direction it should be going. There's a lot of things unique to Connecticut that we don't have in other states. So for example, we build submarines here. It was on the ferry before this book came into being and uh, going to Long Island and I saw this. So I took it. Um, and it's a pretty awesome site really. We also have a lot of ferries. We have ferries that go to Fishers Island, Block Island, and Long Island. This is the oh, and Port Jefferson. So we have a lot of working watercraft here. Port Jeff Ferry goes to Long Island as well. And of course, what's unique to Connecticut is we have the Coast Guard Academy here, and we have the Coast Guard Eagle. And the Coast, these, these again, these are pilot boats, they're tugboats that have to guide a boat this size up the Thames River to her home port at the Coast Guard Museum, sorry, at the Coast Guard Academy. And this is actually her leaving. When I was photographing this book, she had not been back into port for four years. And I was so lucky because she just happened to come in that year that I was working on the book. And the Coast Guard was wonderful. They gave me chase boats to use to get these photographs. And this of course is on board. I did try so hard to get her under sail, but there was no way to organize it because they usually drop sail somewhere out in Long Island Sound and we could never figure out when that was gonna happen. We have a very, uh, this is a chapter on the fishing industry. We have a lot of uh, fishing industry, large fishing industry here. This is Norm Bloom and Sons. This is third generation oyster fisherman out of Norwalk. They're growing oysters now. So they are able to have quite a bit. They do that in their Norwalk property and they go out every morning. This is, these images I went out about, I met them at 5 a.m. I think we started taking photos at 6 a.m. But the light's really the best really early or late day. They also have another branch now called Cops Island Oysters out of Noang. And this is um, a dilapidated shad shack. Shad was big on the Connecticut River back in its day. That's another thing that's unique to Connecticut. And they would sell the shad, the fishermen would catch it. The women would debone it. Um, don't quote me, but there's hundreds of bones in the shad and there's a very specific way to debone it. And they keep that as a closely guarded secret, apparently. Because uh, if you know how to debone it, I guess you can get a handle on your competition. But this shack um, is just a remnant of what was. And there's a little shad museum dedicated to the history of shad. Uh, and it's in Haddam, Connecticut. This is Danny Russell. He's out of Rocky Hill. I had to get up even earlier to meet him. I think this is five in the morning. I think he got up at 3.30 to meet him. He, it, they fish at night for the shad. And he's, he's been doing it for 35 years. He might be if the last or one of the last. When I talked to him when I was doing this book, the shad were not running that year and they just haven't really recovered. But here he is pulling in his boat and here he is cutting up the shad into fillets. A beautiful fish. 
which one of the things he does with it is he is he's been selling it every year he's got a standing order from the um the essex rotary club uh they have this huge fundraiser every year it's their annual shad bake it's at the connecticut review museum and this particular year he didn't danny russell didn't have enough for the shad bake uh that's how limited the shad were that particular year they usually order i think around 300 but this is how they do it they put pork fat on it they nail it to planks and then they cook it like this and people just love it and of course we have the last commercial fish fishing fleet in the state this is out of stonington connecticut that's also unique to Connecticut that we have a commercial fishing fleet. Uh, and this is Clinton Harbor, where they catch lobsters. Uh, there's a chapter on salty dogs, people who have dedicated their life to the ocean and the sea in one form or another. This is Tom Whitten. He is the CEO of North Sales, which is headquartered in Milford, Connecticut, of all places. Another um, unique thing about the industry in Connecticut, the sale industry, they're the largest sail makers in the world. They make racing sales, commercial sales, um, and sales for everyday people. He is also a two time uh, winner of the America's Cup, he raced with, sailed with Dennis Connor, and has been inducted into the America's Cup Hall of Fame, and the another sailing Hall of Fame, which is escaping me now. And he was kindly, very kind, to give me an endorsement for my book. This is Dr. Robert Ballard. Many of you have heard his name because he is credited with raising the Titanic, but he's done so many things for the ocean and education and promoting that. And he's written so many books. This is Steve Jones. Um, he has this very interesting property where he collects boat bits and parts and he never throws anything away. So it's kind of like a graveyard for boats. And he has um, old wheelhouses there and, you know, remnants of sailboats and rowboats and whatever. He just, and portholes, and then he, he builds things out of them. But he um, owns Flat Hammock Press, which publishes books on um, anything maritime related and sea stories. And he used to be a professor at Avery Point of nautical history. This is uh, Alexander's Lake in Dayville, and this is the 110 sailing class. Again, this is unique to Connecticut. Uh, this class of boat was designed by Ray Hunt. Most people know Ray Hunt because he designed the Boston Whaler. And these are avid boat owners who race this, these boats every Sunday, uh, July and August on this lake. Uh, now we're into a chapter that was actually the beginning of it called Races and Rendezvous. And this is the Yale Harvard Regatta, again, unique to Connecticut, one of the oldest sailboat races in the country. 1856 they've been racing on the Thames River and here they are again when I was photographing I was glad that Yale won that particular year in knowing Connecticut uh, there's a big wooden boat community um, just wooden boat enthusiasts and aficionados and every year they have a sailboat race called the Noank Invitational. And before each race, they give out cookies because they wanna keep it light. It's, it's really not about who wins, but about participating and showing off you, you know, the spectacular artwork of these boats. But this is how they hand the cookies to the participants. And here's, uh, they are racing off of Noank. 
They also have out of Mystic every year, we have the Antique and Classic Boat Parade and people love this. They show off their beautiful boats and they get decked out in antique clothing. There's also a chapter on lighthouses and islands and we have quite a few of both in the state. This is Five Mile Point Lighthouse out of New Haven. This is Morgan Light out of Noank, which is now a private residence. And if you look off the edge there, you can see a little house that's Mouse Island. There's three little houses on that island. No electricity. You can only be there in the summer. And they're just the cutest things. This is the Thimble Islands, of course, um, off of Stony Creek. This is my favorite one. I like it because you can see right through it and it's on stilts. This was uh, a close up of Mouse Island, that same house I showed you previously. Then there's a chapter on nautical arts. And this is a um, model boat builder. His name is Roger Hambidge and he, is was responsible for restoring the Morgan. He was head shipwright on that project, the Morgan, which was the last wooden whaler at Mystic Seaport, which I spoke about earlier. So his models are 100% accurate. So you could take this model and build it to, to scale. It, you could build it, sorry, you could take this model just as it is and rebuild it into a large size boat that you could actually sail. And the level of detail is just incredible. Even below deck, if you take off a hatch and you look below deck, he has put in a galley with a stove and bunks for the crew. It's just remarkable. This is a fishing schooner, a Gloucester fishing schooner he replicated. Uh, this is Steve Cryan and he, um, paints steamships and he also trains you might have seen his train show at the Connecticut River Museum in the right around Christmas time but he's known for his work on boats and trains he does this uh, he paints them pretty lifelike and identical uh, this is the Ambrose he's working on which was a light ship and here's another image of his steamship. We used to have steamships going up and down the Connecticut River, and they would also take passengers to New York, which I think would be just an amazing way to commute to New York. This is um, the steamship Connecticut. She's part of a collection out of the um, Griswold Inn under the Paul Foundation. The Pauls have been um, taking all the art that's in the Griswold Inn and slowly restoring it. Um, before museums, you know, the Griswold Inn is pre-revolutionary war and before museums, um, people didn't have places to donate their goods. So they donated a lot of stuff to the Griswold Inn and the collection began pretty organically, but over you know hundreds of years, there's been a lot of cigarette smoke and cigar smoke on it, and just food and just kitchen grease. So they've been restoring these, and they own the largest collection of steamships uh, as it relates to the Connecticut River and the Long Island Island Sound. So next time you go in there, take a look. They're located in Essex. Look at all the stuff on the walls. Uh, again, we're under nautical arts, and this is um, the nautical arts workshop out of Deep River. You can go there and you can take a weekend workshop or a week-long workshop. They all vary. You can make ditty boxes and all sorts of things. This is uh, North Sales, again, the art of sail making. And this is how they do it. Sorry, they they would sew the sail. Um, I wish I had a photo of it, but I don't. 
Um, but basically they lay that sail out. And if you can imagine this, there's a hole, but below them is an op it, it's open. So they're on a platform that's, you know, a few feet high and there would be a square cut out where someone would have a sewing machine and they'd be sitting down below. The sewing machine would be at level with this platform. And then that, that's how they would sew the sail. I don't know if I made any sense on that one. I, I hope you could visualize. Uh, we in Connecticut have lots and lots of snack shacks. We love lobster rolls here. This is the blue ore in Haddam, Connecticut, and you can take your boat there and walk up. It's BYOB. This is uh, in uh, Guilford, Connecticut. This is um, the Guilford Lobster Pound, and they know what they have and they know what they do. They just serve hot dogs, lobster rolls, and clam chowder, and it's all good. And this is Ford's Lobster out of Noack Harbor. Noack Harbor is pretty untouched. There's hardly any commercial development there. It's just a beautiful harbor. That's Mason's Island. That's Ford's Lobster there below on the left. And if you dock to the right, you can put your order in and they will deliver to your boat as they did with these folks. We have Captain Scott's Lobster Dock. This is in New London and they have live music. And this is just a fun place to go. And this is the dock. It's uh, in Waterford, right at the bridge there between Waterford and Niantic. They also have a fish market. This is my favorite one though. This is um, because they, they're open year round and they just have everything. Uh, this is called Stowe's Seafood. It's just amazingly delicious. So then there's a chapter on house boats or boat houses. This is the Maggie P. And she was originally a houseboat and she washed ashore in Fenwick in a storm. And somehow she got grandfathered in because if you know Fenwick, it's filled with very stately homes. Um, and normally a house like this probably wouldn't be allowed to be built, but here she is, she's been in the same family for four or five generations. Very simple design, because again, she was a houseboat and you can see that. And the original owner uh, of, of, the, of the boat was offered insurance for a dollar uh, in 1938. And the woman thought, oh, maybe I should take that insurance, which she did, and then the 38 hurricane came. But surprisingly, this boat survived. These folks are on Niantic on the Niantic River, and they wanted a house that looked like a boat. So this is what they had their architect build for them. And it certainly does look like a boat. And they had like to have parties too on their deck there. Who wouldn't? It's a great view. Now we're into uh, maritime festivals. This is the new. Uh, New London Maritime Heritage Festival. And it takes place on two docks, one at City Pier and one at the pier near Fort Trumbull. And they have different types of vessels coming in, you know, big Navy ships and you can board and you can tour them. Again, this is extremely early in the morning. I keep pressing this point. I do not like to get up early, but I do because it's quiet. I like it once I'm awake, but this is really when you have the best light, as you can see. This is a festival uh, of the Battle of 1812. These role players come, they recreate it on the banks of the Connecticut River at the Connecticut River Museum. This is the Sea Music Festival at Mystic Seaport, which is held every summer. And musicians from all over the world come, they swap stories, they share shanties, and they swap music. It's a wonderful event. 
This is the blessing of the fleet. It happens every year. It's out of Stonington. And they. this again is part of the commercial fishing fleet. So they do have a priest come and he blesses the fleet so they may go out and safely return and they throw reefs into the water for those who unfortunately did not safely return and those who were lost at sea. Uh, we have a few maritime museums and aquariums in Connecticut. This is the Mystic Aquarium in Mystic. And this is of course a, a beautiful beluga whale. And I noticed when I was photographing them that Anytime a child came by, they got very excited and they were interacting. So this whale is interacting with that child and is looking at that child and came over to see her, which I just think is really cool. Uh, the Mystic Museum does not have sharks, but the Norwalk Maritime Museum does. And they, they're a lot larger. Um, in what they offer. And they host many, many school groups as well. And this of course is the Mystic Seaport, which I spoke about earlier on the banks of the Mystic River. Uh, this is the Connecticut River Museum. It is the only museum dedicated to the Connecticut River on the 400 miles of the Connecticut River which starts in Old Saybrook at the mouth and goes all the way up to Canada. Uh, this river is not developed at its mouth and has escaped industry unlike so many rivers because of the eternally shifting sandbars. They, there was no way to develop it, which is just great. It's been hailed as one of the last great places on earth by the Nature Conservancy. And they have music there, I believe, on Thursdays. You can check their schedule. Then there's a chapter on maritime education. This is the Amistad. Uh, she is Connecticut's flagship. And uh, school children go out on this vessel. So do um, non-school children. You know, you could just go out as an adult and hang out on the boat. And they will tell you the story of the Amistad. Um, school groups go out and they also learn the art of sailing in addition to learning about the ship. It's a beautiful boat. They were so accommodating to me when I wanted to get these shots. They stuck me out in a dinghy that someone else drove and they drove me around and around the boat repeatedly. Every time I said, oh, as photographers always do, could I get one more, just one more. This is the Maritime Education Network. They are out of Old Saybrook and they take inner city kids out to teach them all different things about the ocean. Some of them have never been on a boat before. They teach them about what's in the ocean. They teach them about navigation, how to read charts, how to drive the boat and lots of other valuable things to give them an appreciation for our waterways and for nature. This is the schooner Brilliant. Um, she was designed by Olin Stevens, who I spoke about earlier, who um, designed America's Cup boats uh, back in the heyday of yachting, the golden age of yachting. This boat is a sail training vessel out of Mystic. And the owner, the original owner of the boat was Walter Bartum. And he told Olin Stevens that he wanted a boat that was fast enough to stay, sail and win races, but strong enough to roll over in a hurricane. And that's exactly what this boat does. This is one of my favorite boats. She's just a beauty. And she's one of a kind. There's only one boat that has ever been made like this. This is the River Quest. She is out of East Haddam, but I think she just started going out of uh, the Connecticut River Museum again. And in the uh, late summer, just is, I think around late August or early September, people come from all over to this area of Old Lyme near the bridge near Calves Island to see 
all the swallows come at sunset. It's just an amazing thing. Thousands upon thousands come to roost in the reeds at night, but they, what, they all come at once and precisely at sunset, I don't know how they do it. They make a funnel and they drop down into the reeds. It's phenomenal. And that boat will take you out if you don't have a boat. This is Shetfield Island. It is in Norwalk. And you can take a ferry boat from the Norwalk Maritime Museum through the Norwalk Historical Association, and you can enjoy a clam bank on the island. They also have a lighthouse, Sheffield Island Lighthouse, and you can tour it while you're having your clam bake. And this is what it looks like on the way to Shetfield Island. It's a lot of little islands off of Norwalk. This is a witch paddle off of Mystic, Connecticut at Halloween time, which is just so much fun. You can just stand on the bridge and watch everybody in their costumes, or you can participate. Just get a paddle and go. Uh, this is the Connecticut River Drifting Society. And the gentleman in the yellow in the foreground is um, Wick Griswold. And he's written several books on the Connecticut River. And he's also a teacher at UConn. And this is his little society. And I'm not belittling him by using the word little. Uh, anybody is welcome to participate, but this is it thus far. And they just meet up um, and they go out and they just enjoy a paddle on the river, whatever your kind of boat you've got. And then they drift. We also have a couple of duck races. Uh, <laughs> this is in Naugatuck, the Naugatuck duck race. There are people at the other end with a net catching the ducks so they don't pollute and leave them in the waters. This, and there's also one in Chester, Connecticut as well. Uh, this is a cardboard boat race. This is a chapter I have in the book on uh, fun in the sun. This is a really fun event every year at Avery Point. The students make these um, cardboard boats and they hang out with their teachers and it's they kind of wrap up their school year at, for UConn. And uh, I selected this particular image because you can see they didn't get very far at all, but they are having so much fun. This is a tiki boat out of Stamford Harbor. You bring your own, you go out, listen to music. It's, you know, hang out, have fun. Uh, they also have one out of Noank, Connecticut. I tried very hard to capture the majesty of the Connecticut River, which I really don't feel that I succeeded in. I even went up in an airplane to try and get it, but it's just so vast and big. Uh, but this is my best attempt. Then I reverted back to land and carried my camera everywhere with me while I was looking on the book. This is near East Haddam Bridge, very early in the morning where, you know, the, the river's still waking up at, and the light is just really nice here. And here she is again, the Connecticut River, all different phases. And there's a chapter called Coming Into Port. This is the city of New London. Uh, this is Clinton Harbor. This is uh, Rogers Lake. This is where I live. It's a beautiful lake. This has not been doctored. This is really what it looks like at sunset. Of course, it varies day to day. And this is also Rogers Lake. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed my talk. So we have a question that just came in. Uh, Leslie's wondering where was the image taken from the plane? Over Essex. I can't say exactly where, but it was near um, the marinas. 
And, and I actually have a question. So I know you are a very talented photographer. And I was just curious how you ended up focusing on the waterways. Oh, um, I should have said something about this. Um, I worked uh, for many, many years for a lot of boating publications and was for 15 years, I was offshores magazines, Connecticut photographer, um, cause they were new England based magazine. They had a lot of iterations after that until they went belly up. I also used to work at mystic seaport museum. So I really developed an affinity there where I met a lot of these people. So when the, uh, publisher approached me about the book, you know, my mind started firing and I already knew some of the people to talk to or what should go in. And then of course it develops as you move along. And I love boats and I sail. <laughs> <laughs> well, that explains it. <laughs> no, actually um, your sunsets, I actually was able to enjoy your book. And I mean, the pictures of the animals like O.C. the cat, the yeah. pictures of the sunsets. I mean, just really beautiful photography. Thank you so much. And Thank I'm you. really delighted to hear that you have a book coming up next year. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and can't wait for that. Thank you. I can't say what it's about, but it does have to do with outside the outdoors. <laughs> And I also noticed um, in the uh, the bio in the book that you had done a Christmas book as well. Yes. So it's, where do you where do you get your ideas? Um, this this actually the publisher approached me about that as well, which was my first time working with them. I uh, I also worked for magazines, so I pitched a story to Victoria Magazine about Christmas in the Connecticut River Valley, and Ann Nyberg who had just finished her Katherine Hepper book, knew the publisher was looking to do a Christmas book and recommended me after seeing me post that article on Facebook about Christmas in the Connecticut River Valley. So um, I didn't know anything then about Christmas in Connecticut and how much there is to do and see and how I mean, people love Christmas and they really love it in Connecticut. So I really like that book because it just yeah. really shows if you pick it up, you know, it'll give you the lowdown on where to go and what to do and what to see. Well, and actually your presentation tonight did that for me because yeah. al although I visited many of the places that you mentioned, including Stowe's in West Haven, and oh, I yeah. do agree, um, there were many, many celebrations and activities that I didn't know anything about. That Halloween one in particular looks like yeah, a load of fun. It is fun. And I really <laughs> wanted to, I like to do that with all my books, make it part travel guide because um, I love to travel, but also, um, sorry, I think I come to it with that mindset when selecting what should go in because I want people to be able to not just read it, but be able to do some of what's in it. Yeah, Sarah wants to know if you have a particular favorite spot. I love Rogers Lake. <laughs> I'm partial <laughs> to it because I live there. But I prefer swimming in the ocean. And you know what? Noank is beautiful. And uh, the water there is so clean and clear. And Neil is mentioning that at one time, New Haven had its own steamship. And oh. did you uncover any of that history in your work? Gosh, I didn't. I wish I did. And he's all, uh, Ralph is asking, is the wooden boat show in Niantic still being held? Well, there's a wooden boat show at Mystic Seaport. Um, they had it last June. And they have one at in at the Connecticut River Museum. I don't know about anyone in Niantic. Yeah. Well, it looks like that's all the questions okay. we have right now. Great. Great. I've just been so thrilled to be able to uh, look through and read your book. And um, I'm so looking forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.
you're very welcome. Have a wonderful evening. And perhaps we'll see you around the coastline and the waterways okay, in the summer. Great. Thank you so much. Good night. Take care. Bye.